Hi everyone! In this tutorial series, I'll be building this very simple game with HTML5. What's special about this game is that if you put all the files inside of a zip file, the total size of the file is less than 13 kilobytes. Why does that matter? Because we can use a game like that to participate in the JS13K games, an online competition, it's free to participate, that's done every year, and of which as, as Zemba we are very proudly to support, and I'm one of the judges as well. So this is a great competition and it's a really good occasion to practice, um, to get your first game out there. Since you have so many restrictions with the, with the size of the files, um, it's a perfect occasion to keep the scope very simple and just concentrate on finishing something on time. So the artwork of the, of the game that you saw can be found in Open Game Art and was created by Charm. This artwork has been provided with a Creative Commons license, so if you want to use it, uh, um, you have to give the corresponding attribution. This is a great website to find artwork for, for games, um, but always take a look at what the license says. The library that we'll be using to build this game is actually a micro framework of JavaScript called Contra. We cannot use a fully fledged um, JavaScript game library such, a, such as Phaser because the size would be too big. So we have to use one of these micro frameworks. Moreover, if you use the actual full, uh, even the minified file, it will still be too big because I went a bit too far with the image sizes. But uh, what we'll do at the end is generate our own build so that it's smaller, it only contains the code that we need. This Contra library has um, good documentation here, a wiki, and it's a library that's good to prototype ideas to get something uh, up and going really quickly. It doesn't have all the options and features that you that you would find in a library like Phaser, um, but using it shows the minimal uh, the minimal elements that you need to create a game with HTML5. The requirement of this tutorial series is to have at least the basic knowledge of JavaScript. If you're new to JavaScript or if you already know the basics but you want to get better at it and you want to learn also how to make games with JavaScript, um, check out our online course, the Complete Mobile Game Development Course, Platinum Edition, which teaches JavaScript from scratch by creating this game and then builds up on what's uh, covered in each module to create a total of 15 mobile games or browser games as well using JavaScript and the Phaser library. So all of the games that you see here are included in the course. It's over 30 hours of video and I personally respond or try to respond to my best to respond all student questions. So feel free to check it out. And now let's get started with our game. So you can download the files from a link that should be in the description of the video. Um, as I mentioned, the, the, the file for control that we'll use is not the same as the one here, but you can also download this one and it will, it will work just as fine. So we'll begin with a simple folder structure. That is actually the finished game. Let's go to the new game. So we'll have a folder called lib where we'll place this control library and a folder called source where we're going to have our own custom file. It's zero kilobyte at the moment because there's nothing there. It's an empty JavaScript file called game.js. And then we have index.html, which is going to be the entry point of your game. And you do need to have a file called index.html in your game, in your JS 13 kilobytes game. So let's start by initializing a canvas element. Um, what we have here is a very basic HTML starter, which all it does is um, it includes the, the the build of the of the library and also my empty game.js game.js uh, file. Um, so the very first thing you need to do is create a canvas element. 
think of the canvas as a 2D drawing area where our game will be drawn. So we're going to give this canvas an ID of game and we will give it a, a width of um, 256 and a height of 256 as well. So we have now um, our, a canvas element, which obviously doesn't do anything yet. So you, what you can do is you can open this file and I'm going to be using Google Chrome, the tutorial. And if you went and explored the source code, uh, or um, I mean the, the, the DOM, the document object model of the page, you would find your canvas right there. Um, a few other things that I would like to include before we actually start building the game. Um, I want to paint the, the body of my page. So I'm going to add some CSS here. And obviously, ideally, you would use an external CSS file. But I want to keep things very simple. So I'm just adding it all here. So I like to paint the background to uh, black. And also, I want to give some style to the canvas so that it's responsive. So we so that we have a canvas that is responsive, which means that it um, increases or decreases size. It adjusts to the size of the screen. So uh, first of all, I want my canvas to have a background color of white so that we can distinguish it right away. Um, then I would like my canvas to occupy 100% of the available space, but it's going to have a maximum width of uh, 480 pixels so that it doesn't look too blurry on a big screen. We want our canvas to center, so I'll give it a margin of auto. And also we need, uh, for, for it to actually look centered um, by using this, this CSS trick, it needs to display as a block. So if I re, uh, reset the page, you can see now that, um, that the canvas, it has that maximum size, but if the screen is um, smaller, um, by that I mean actually the, the width is smaller, um, we can still fit the game. And then again, this is not um, a fully uh, fledged game. This is just a, an easy prototype for us to get something going. So let's begin with our game.js file. So I'm going to go to that file. And the first thing you want to do is to initiate a Contra object. So by including the Contra library, we have access to this Contra object. So we have to initiate that. Um, then there are, uh, there are three things here that are very important. There is a concept of the game loop. A game loop is something that gets called over and over and over and over multiple times per second. Ideally, uh, when it comes to rendering, it should be around 60 times per second. In this library, uh, both the updating the game elements and the rendering is done um, within this game loop object. So I'm going to create that object. I'm going to call it loop. And this will be contra.game loop. And inside of this object, you have to, there are two um, methods that we have to add in here. One of them is update. So this, this gets called multiple times per second. And it's what allows you to check things like collision detection or user input. So it's, a, it's if you're familiar with phaser, it's quite similar to the update method in phaser. Um, so if, if we, in this case, I was meant to declare a sprite. So if we have a sprite, this is where you would update Call the update method of all the sprites that you have so that they can update their positions and whatnot. Then we have render, which takes care of displaying things. For example, if you move a sprite here, then you need to redraw it so that it's, look, it's shown on the new position. So in this case, um, you would update that sprite in that manner. And obviously, we were meant to create the sprite here. So let's create a sprite. A sprite. Sprites are the shapes that you will use in your game. So they don't necessarily have need to have an image. It can be just a rectangle, which is what we'll actually do now. So we'll give our, our sprite coordinates. Uh, the coordinate X starts from 
left to right, so it's zero in here and it goes positive in this direction. And the coordinate on Y starts on zero on the top and goes down. And the position of your sprite that when you det when you say, for example, I want my sprite to be in coordinate 50-50, that would be the top left corner of your sprite is where you is what you're really placing. So I want to uh, put this sprite in position X 100. And by the way, the size of the of the canvas is what what we determined here. So it can be that that is how big our canvas is. So I want to show this sprite in this coordinate. And I also have to specify uh, a width and a height. So let's give it a width of 50 and a height of 100. And also we can give it a color, which can be entered as, as any, anything that works in CSS will work here. So for example, it can be green. So if we save that, um, we're creating the, this sprite in here in our loop we are calling the um, sprites in Contra have this update method on their own. So you could add uh, an update method here and uh, add some checks that you want to perform, some things that you want to add. Uh, same thing with render. If you want to show it in a different way, you can have that a render method in the sprite itself. Uh, but for this to actually start, we need to initiate this loop. So that was the third part that I wanted to mention. Um, and now we should have that sprite showing on the screen on the coordinates that we determine. Um, just to show you what the origin is, so it's the top left corner, it's placed in there. Now, what if you want to give your sprite some movement? With the X, we can give it a speed on X, for example, 1, and we can also give it a speed on Y, 0.5. So if we refresh the page, you can see now that it moves. Now you will you will see that sometimes the there is a bit of uh, the, the the quality of the movement is not necessarily as smooth as it is, for example, in the phaser. Um, but that's why I was saying that this library is good for quick prototypes. Um, but it's not as comp it doesn't have all the rendering more um, comprehensive features that a library like phaser has. So. Now you know how to create a basic sprite on the screen. And if you wanted to add any checks for the sprite, for example, uh, if something is happening or if the position is, some, is, is a certain value, you could do it, uh, you could do it in there. And, and you could access the X, for example, by sprite.x would give you the current coordinate. So for example, if you do console.log um, sprite.x, that will give you, and we go to console here, that will be showing you the X. So now it is challenge time, challenge time for you guys. The challenge is you have to, you will have to pause the video as soon as I start this, stop describing it. And then I will show you the answer of the challenge. So the challenge is to create a sprite, give it the speed on, on X like we did and make it bounce off the edges of the screen so that the sprite is moving this way and then it reaches the edge of the screen or some arbitrary value. And then you give it, you make it move to the other side. And again, when it reaches a certain point, you will make it go back and forth. So your challenge is to make that work. Uh, you can use this link here as starting code. And when you finish, please um, try to upload it somehow or put a screenshot in the commenting area so that people can see how you did it. And also I can check as well that people are getting the, that people are getting it right. So pause your video and try, try it on your own and share it in the comments. Okay, we're back. And now I'm gonna show you what the solution of this challenge it can be because there's not always a single solution. So, as I mentioned in this update area, we can check for things. So I'm going to check that the position on X is, uh, is if, it, if it happens to be greater or equal than a certain value, I want my sprite to go back. We know that the width of the screen of the canvas is 256 and also the width of the sprite is 50. So 
if I want my sprite to literally reach the very edge, I have to, it would be 256 minus 50. So it would be 206. If this happens, I want the speed of the sprite to be reversed. So I want the speed of the sprite, the x, to be equal to minus 1. Now, that, that will do it. I'm going to add a, 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 just a bit of a, of a trick in case the sprite, for example, re, uh, was too, uh, it was too far in, uh, it would get stuck. So I, I, I'm going to actually push it to this point so that it's not valid in the next, uh, in the next iteration. Actually, we can, we can do something like that. So it's, it's never going to get stuck. So that will make it bounce in one side. And then for the other side, if it's less than or equal than 50, then we are going to do the same thing. So we're going to push it to 51 and we are going to set the speed to one again. So let's try see if this works. See if I got it right. So it is bouncing now. We probably had, we, we, we can remove the Y um, aspect. So the, the, we don't have a velocity in Y. Let's try it again, see if we got it right. So it is bouncing in that direction. And on the other direction, it seems to be bouncing uh, very, very early. And it is because it should be zero. Because remember that the, it, it is the left, um, it is on the left side. So the left side needs to be zero. So let's try this again. So we got that one right. And we got this one right as well. So we have a bouncing rectangle. How did you go with the challenge? Let me know in the comments if you got it right and let's continue with the next um, chapter.